Hello, and welcome to lecture six of AMAT 502 at UAlbany. Today we're gonna to be talking about some more data types, as well as another very clever application of recursion known as the edit distance. So just as a heads up, it's gonna be a lot of syntactical um, content right at the very beginning of the lecture. Um, I'm gonna encourage you to move to that very briefly, and I will do the same. Um, this being a Jupyter notebook, you can also refer to it um, as notes later um, during active learning exercises and as you're working on the problem sets. The real highlight for today is gonna be an understanding of something known as the edit distance between strings. Of course, there are various edit distances between strings, which we'll get into in a moment. So as a quick hierarchy, we've already considered lists. Um, a list is a collection of objects. They can be strings or integers, and they don't even have to be of the same type. Um, in this list, one of its properties is that it has to be ordered and changeable, sometimes also called mutable. Um, you can also have duplicate members. So I can have a string like cat and another entry which also has cat. And there's no problem with that for a list. Additionally, there's the notion of a tuple. Uh, a tuple is essentially like a list. It's ordered, but the key difference is it is not mutable. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. Um, this means it's more of a static data type. And so you'll have to think carefully when an application calls for that. Um, additionally, there's the notion of a set. A set is a collection which is unordered and unindexed, um, but also no duplicate members are allowed. And then finally, data structure, which we'll be using most after lists, is that of a dictionary. A dictionary is a collection which is unordered, changeable, and indexed, but the way in which it's indexed is a little different. We don't use integers, rather we use notion of keys, and the thing which corresponds to a given value or object with an associated key is known as its value. All right, so as a quick reminder, we already covered that in Python, lists are defined using square brackets. Um, and there are some various op operations we can perform on lists. Uh, we can append a list, uh, an item to a list. We can insert an item where we have to provide the item and the index. Uh, we can also reverse a list. Um, and we can also sort a list. These are all built-in operations. Um, so just as a quick reminder, here I've got a list of strings where statistics appears twice. I ask to append analysis, I print that strip this list, and then I also insert at position one complex analysis. And you'll see here that I've got a slightly larger list and I've appended the entry where I need to. Here are two more operations which we didn't discuss last time. That's the notion of removing an item at a specified um, removes an item of a specified value. And we can also remove an item at a given index. Um, this is known as remove and pop. So just to see how that works. Remember, when I had A originally, I had two instances of statistics. And if I asked to remove statistics, it actually only removes the first instance of statistics. Um, so it's not going to completely clean out your list as you might like. Um, additionally, if I were to pop, that means I'm going to access my list at a given index, here index 2, and then I'm going to extract the entry there and just remove it. So again, since we're using base to zero counting, um, that corresponds to the thing that's in the third position, which is topology, which after we pop topology out of this list, uh, it is no longer there. So one concept which we're not gonna dwell on much here, but I wanna go ahead and introduce it, is that one way of thinking of lists is that you can also have objects inside that list which are themselves lists. These are known as lists of lists. You can also think of these as multi-dimensional lists. Um, and just as in a string where we use square brackets to access a character at a given index, um, we can use whole sequences of square brackets to access lists that are in sublists of those. So for example, if I have A, which has uh, three items in it, 
three lists, one consisting of the list one, two, another consisting of the list three, four, another consisting of the list five, six. If I uh, execute these commands, print just returns the list that's in the first position. That's a sub zero. But if I ask what is a sub zero, square brackets, a sub one, then again, reading from left to right, I know I access the first list, that's what the thing in index zero. And then I ask, and I uh, print the item that's in the first position, or first index, that's the second position. Um, but I can also mutate, meaning if I wanna change an entry, I can go ahead and do this whole reassignment process where I'm gonna take the thing on the left and set it to the value on the right. And you'll see here that it does indeed change your list where it used to be one, two, now it's one, three. Tuples, as I said, are very much like lists, but they're immutable. So you can't use a method like append. And this is what you're gonna use if you have something that's surrounded by round brackets. Um, normally we think of round brackets as being used with functions, um, but they also provide a data structure themselves, um, but not one which we can alter. So if I take my tuple of two, three, four, and print the thing that's at index two, that's the last item on my list, four. Um, and if I try to do any of these other commands, I'll get a type error, because it'll tell me that tuple object does not support item assignment. That's basically Python's way of saying, you can't mutate a list, a tuple. All right. There's other, one other thing you need to be aware of with tuples which is if you wanna take a tuple that consists of exactly one object, um, you need to use a comma, even if you don't wanna have a second item. So for example, if I wanna have a tuple S where I just have a one, um, I need to throw in this extra comma. Now, if I extract this and I comment this out, I'll notice that I get another type error. And this comes from inspecting this last line here. So it's here I've got the situation where I'm slicing a tuple, and that's something I can do. Um, and then I'm trying to add this entry S. Um, and it allows me to concatenate tuples, um, but it recognizes now that S has a different type. So indeed, if I go ahead and comment out this line, this line, and I instead ask for what is type of S, it'll say type of S is end. So meaning if you try to have a tuple consisting of just one object, it's just gonna use that object. Um, there are some good reasons under the hood for why this should be the case, but uh, nothing to worry about here. So. All right, our next data structure is known as a set. So just as in mathematics, we use curly braces um, to denote a set in Python. A set is a collection which is unordered, unindexed, and it is mutable. You can change it. So this has the sort of opposite function of a tuple, um, meaning that um, it is unlike a tuple in that it's unordered versus ordered. Um, and unlike a tuple in the sense that it's unindexed, whereas a tuple is indexed, but it's actually changeable, um, exactly the opposite of a tuple. So the opposite of a, of a tuple is really a set in Python. Um, we can also do some of these things like add and remove. Uh, but notice that because sets are unordered, we don't want to use the command append, because an append really has a notion that there is an order of our of our data collection. So we'll also see that another way of removing or dealing with entries in a set is to use this pop operation, which removes the sort of first entry. And we're gonna see below that this kind of behaves inconsistently and differs depending on sort of what operations you've run. Um, I've myself noticed different behavior upon different runs. So let's go ahead and explore an example here. 
So S is gonna be the set consisting of three strings, algebra, topology, and analysis. Um, and then we're gonna consider the operation where we add statistics. Notice we can't specify an index because sets are unindexed. Um, and then we can apply the pop operation. So let's see how these all interact. Okay. So notice that in this iteration of running this code cell, where I've considered S being algebra topology analysis, I decided to print topology first. Earlier iterations where I've run this, I've actually gotten algebra analysis and topology at the end, which seems to reflect that they might be doing some automatic sorting. Um, however, that's not something we wanna do in general. Adding statistics, in this case, seems to add it right at the beginning of our set. Sorry, I think sick. Sorry for that. So you can see here that when I've clicked add um, statistics to my set, it's gone ahead and appended it in front of algebra. Uh -oh. Or sorry, in front of uh, after, just after statistics. Oh. In general, you're going to get some inconsistent behavior with sets. So just try not to worry too much about it. And just know that these aren't features you should be using anyways. Finally, we have this um, behavior that we've already, I've encouraged some of you to use in class. Um, so with for loops, especially if you have an object that is something you can iterate over, um, you can just go ahead and exploit that to your advantage by just going ahead and saying for i in a list, um, and then you'll have direct access to the objects. You won't need to necessarily use the phrase range. Uh, so in contrast um, to lists in sets, this is really something you, you can't really do as you might, uh, might think you can. So for example, here I have for x and s, and if I process this, Again, you'll notice that it behaves in a slightly different order than what we just did. There are lots of operations you can perform on sets, and these mimic the operations you can perform on sets in mathematics. I encourage you to look at this list and maybe experiment with a few examples. Finally, and this is probably the second most important data structure after lists, um, and that's the notion of a dictionary. We'll see that sometimes it's very convenient to use a dictionary, especially as we start using NumPy, Pandas, I should say, um, and other standard packages associated with data science. So for example, the way we define a dictionary is very similar to a set. We use curly braces, but one of the key differences is that we need to use a colon to separate what's known as keys and values. Keys are our stand-in for indices for a dictionary. Um, so this is like, instead of having the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, up through a length of your list minus 1 as possible uh, indexes, you can instead think that those are going to be keys for whatever values stored in those entries. Um, this is especially useful if you have objects where there's really some important information associated to the values. Um, and we'll get to an example that shows that right now. Um, but to quickly review, dictionaries are unordered, they are changeable, and they are indexed, but they're not indexed using numbers. They're usually indexed using strings or whatever you use to specify your key values. So for example, if I consider my car, and I'm going to go ahead and split up my dictionary across several lines, although there's not really any reason to do this. Well, I'm going to use brand, model, and year to denote my key values, my keys. And then associated, or the thing which I want bound to those keys, are going to be the values. Um, so for example, my brand, maybe I should call it make. There's a Ford. And if I want to know what the make of my car is, then I can do this. So this sort of shows how dictionaries are kind of more intuitive data structure, especially when you're dealing with sort of real life things like cars. and. Uh, as we'll see later, people and maybe some of their attributes. Um, if you have a dictionary and you don't necessarily know what the keys or the values are, you can always 
just apply those methods. Um, and again, remember the way a method is called. So I have my object, use a little period, the dot, and then whatever method I'm invoking. You know? In this case, keys with nothing in the round brackets. Um, and here, values with, again, nothing in the round brackets. So if I have my car, which we just saw, if I ask to print, it's gonna let me know, again, what's this type? What are, what are these, that is this thing? Um, when I take keys and I return that as an attribute, and I'm gonna get a list of all the keys. And then similarly, if I ask for the values associated in my dictionary, I'm gonna return a list of values. All right, so that's essentially all I wanted to cover in terms of data collection types. Um, and this is something you might need to refer back to or look for other reading sources. So now let's consider something else different. We're looking here at a beautiful illustration by a naturalist from the 1800s by the name of Ernst Haeckel. Um, Ernst Haeckel is really more of an artist, um, but he was very fascinated by nature and always liked to diagram things. He was also very philosophical and interested in the developments in science at this time um, and became an ardent follower of Darwin, although he had some important differences with Darwin's ideas. We'll see how that's related soon enough. So as a warm up, I wanna return to one of our most basic data types, which is that of a string. Um, strings show up everywhere. Um, and one of the things which we wanna consider now is how do we compare strings, um, maybe not just in terms of order, but maybe I wanna give a number which specifies the distance between two strings. Um, you know, just like in a, in a dictionary, if we think of a dictionary as being ordered, um, we have this ability to look at two different words and then ask how far apart are they in the dictionary. But here we're gonna consider a different thing. We use the underlying characters as a sort of an agreement or difference operator. We can use that to specify some notion of distance between uh, strings. So for example, if I had my two strings, cats and dogs, how different are they? Well, obviously as animals, they're very different, but in terms of strings, uh, they do agree at least in the last place, which is that they both have an S in the fourth position, um, but they also have the same length. So that's something that's going in favor for them. Now what would happen if we instead considered strings like spam and spa? Um, these are strings which are related by known as a deletion, um, a deletion in the last place. Now, alternatively, we could consider two strings, a loud and loud, and they look very similar, um, but the difference is they have different lengths, and the first string has an extra character at the, at the beginning. So you might think of S5 or S6 being related to S5 by way of an insertion, right? Insert the letter A. No. But you might also think of insertion as just deleting a character. Um, and then finally, most mysteriously of all, we might consider how different are the strings alien and sales? So even though these guys have the same length, uh, they're going to be very different underneath something called the Hamming distance, um, but a little closer when we consider something called the edit distance. As I'll make clear, even though there are various notions of edit distances, um, colloquially we usually think of one particular thing as the edit distance. So as I just mentioned, there's the notion of the Hamming distance. And so one way of quantifying the difference between strings is to compare them by character by character. So just stack one right on top of the other and then ask, is this one the same? If it is, count it as a zero, and then you go to the next entry, and you ask if the next ones match. If those disagree, you'll add one to your counter. Oh. And then you're just gonna move through, and if we assume that these strings have the same length, uh, we could just add up the number of positions in which they disagree, and that's the Hamming distance. So, for example, S1 and S2, that was cats and dogs. The distance between cats and dogs well, they're different in the first three positions, but they agree in the fourth. 
So the Hamming distance between them is three. You can see how this would be very easy to go ahead and code up. Um, and indeed it is. So here I have my doc string, I initiate my counter at zero, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and consider for i in the range of the length of the first string, if those entries are different, then I'm gonna add one to my counter. And if they're not different, meaning they're the same, I'm not gonna do anything to my counter. I'm just gonna keep marching forward in my for loop. So let's go ahead and see what this code does. And it does what I promised it would. It says that the distance between cats and dogs is three, precisely because the first three characters are different between both of those strings. Now, what would happen if I try to do this other distant comparison, where I consider spam and spa? One thing we'll consider in our active learning exercises is how could I modify this definition of the Hamming distance so that I can actually get a distance between spam and spa, which recognizes the fact that they agree in the third position, first three positions, but disagree in the first. No. All right, but for now, let's see what happens when I run this code. All right, so we've exactly landed in one of the cases we didn't think carefully about. Namely, when I initialize my for loop, I use the length of the first string. The length of the first string is longer than the second one. Spam has four entries, whereas spa has only three characters. And so what happens is when I get to my third and final position, um, and I go to march forward in this uh, for loop, I'm gonna to get to a situation where I'm gonna ask for a character that doesn't exist in this second string spa. All right, we'll consider the distances between some of these other ones later. But one thing to consider is what happens if I go ahead and try to do alien and sales? So, do that. So it shows that the Hamming distance between alien and sales is four. That makes sense because the only way in which these two agree is in this fourth position, which is where they both have E. So although the first three disagree, the fourth one is in agreement, so we don't change our counter. But then in our last character, we do change our counter because n is not equal to s. All right, so you might be asking, and this is a reasonable question, why should you care? Well, the Hamming distance, again, was traditionally formulated uh, not for all strings, but actually for strings just consisting of zeros and ones. You know, binary strings. This is the binary code which all of our computers operate on. Of course, this has become a huge part of our digital existence. But the reason why Hamming considered this distance wasn't just to have a distance named after him. He was interested in a very important algorithm or notion called error correcting codes. He wanted to understand if I send some sort of signal over a noisy channel, much in the same way that Shannon considered in his highly influential mathematical theory of communication. How might I ensure ways of making sure my signal gets propagated through this noisy channel, but where I'm able to reconstruct and maybe have less noise or less corruption in my signal? So here's an example which I borrowed from Wikipedia. So Essentially, some scientists down at NASA Goddard decided to experiment with what happens when you try to send a signal, in this case an image, um, uh, through a, some sort of noisy medium like our atmosphere. You know, our, our atmosphere actually consists of all sorts of ways in which it can corrupt the transmission of the signal, um, whether it's electromagnetic or otherwise. No. Either way, these scientists wanted to show how a particular type of error corrector code, known as the Reed-Solomon method, could be used to go ahead and reconstruct, surprisingly reliably, this picture of the Mona Lisa. So again, 
if you're sending a signal, but you don't do any sort of fancy modification of how you send your signal, this is what we mean by no coding, then just like, you know, scratches and pops on a record, uh, you'd receive an image which looks like this. However, if you did some sort of fancier encoding, um, and there are various ways of doing this, perhaps where you repeat a signal multiple times, um, you can provide an algorithm or even in the presence of noise, you're able to reliably reconstruct your image, at least up to some fidelity. And of course, no lecture in 2020 would be complete without talking about coronaviruses. So as you know, there are several different types of coronaviruses, and in fact, a lot of flus are. Um, of course, the reason why we're having this class online is due to SARS-CoV-2, uh, so this is a SARS coronavirus and the second of its type. Um, and this is the virus which causes the disease COVID-19, uh, known as coronavirus disease, first observed in 2019. But again, there are plenty of other coronaviruses. One thing I learned from a colleague that's very interesting is that coronaviruses have the ability to essentially perform error correcting codes on their own RNA. Um, so this means that when it gets into a person's body and starts making copies of itself, it wants to make sure that there is, again, some fidelity in the replication so that it can keep replicating. And the things that make it you know, very nasty, it can either keep that way um, without it sort of petering itself out from its own existence. Um, here's a link to an article from the um, RNA biology, which goes through the whole notion of how coronaviruses actually engage in their own sort of proofreading. Of course, to up the ante a little bit more, aside from coronavirus, there's also cancer. Cancer is, again, one of the largest um, sources of fatalities in the United States today. Um, not the largest, because that's heart disease. Cancer is one of the things that makes cancer nefarious, is that it usually results from mutagens. These are things that cause mutations in your DNA. Um, just like if you spend too much time outside in the sun without wearing sunblock, um, you can get skin cancer, because essentially electromagnetic rays cause some sort of weird transcription or other error to occur um, in your DNA, which can sometimes cause it to uh, copy itself um, without any regulation. And this is essentially where tumors come from, which can be very nasty. Um, there are different ways of mutating DNA sequences. Um, and as you, if you remember, DNA is considered a, a pairs of certain bases, and each of these bases are assigned a certain letter which comes from their chemical type. Um, and we summarize these using C, T, A, and G. So one way in which you can mutate this gene, uh, this sequence of, of base pairs, is to say, insert a G, a guanine. No. Alternatively, you could delete, and that's where you know, this little trash icon, the delete and adding. Um, you could also duplicate, so for example, we could take a whole pair, CT, and then go ahead and repeat that. Or we could also do some transposition, also called an inversion. We're gonna focus on these first, these second and third types, known as insertion and deletion. Um, in some sense, when we were thinking about the Hamming distance, we were just asking how many substitutions would we need to do if I went character by character to try to turn one string into the other. Uh, but here, by considering insertions and deletions, we can consider the distance between genes that have varying length. Um, I highly recommend you go ahead and look at this article, which is supposedly written for kids, or at least uh, bright young minds. It tells you how to protect your genes from mutations with a healthy lifestyle, including wearing sunscreen. All right, let's step back even further. So, Obviously, cancer is horrible. It takes people often far too young. But mutations are often also what drives evolution, at least when taken at a macro scale. One way in which um, we've already observed evolution is already like the evolution of viruses, um, the ordinary flu virus, but also uh, the coronavirus. These are sometimes considered examples of microevolution, meaning they don't change 
the species too much, or maybe if it is a new species, it's still very related or nearby. Uh, many people accept that microevolution does happen because we can actually prove it in the lab with just a few short, uh, even months of experiments. Um, it's considered more controversial by some people, but completely well accepted by most scientists and educated people. It's the notion of macroevolution, which is that we as humans and all other animals have essentially been derived from a common ancestor. And this is beautifully captured by Ernst Haeckel's Tree of Life. So you can see here, considers the notion of there being some uh, single origin species that then branched off as various mutations sort of amalgamated and created functionally different organisms. You know, we'll see some further uh, close-ups of this picture, but if you go to this Wikimedia website, you'll see very large high definition scans of this. If we zoom in on this tree, and this is one of the beautiful sort of fractal natures of any sort of tree-like process, is we can also consider the origin of how vertebrates, and here, we are looking at more modern times, but if we go back to the Paleozoic, and again, this is by Ernst Haeckel, um, we can consider how common ancestors, uh, starting with things which were invertebrates, we have our stereotypical story of, of the sort of fish or something that climbed onto land and became one of our first sources of reptiles, and then bifurcations between reptile tiles and proto mammals um, eventually gave rise to this whole sort of subtype of organisms known as mammals, which includes humans. Um, so again, we took the previous picture and we just sort of scan in by looking at a smaller subtree of this larger tree of life. And you can see it gets increasingly complex. Another one of Heckel's designs in terms of, we zoom in even further and ask, how did humans arise? Where did we come from? So one way in which, again, a lot of common understanding and the understanding which was at, or around even at the time of Darwin and also Heckel in the late 1800s was that primates and other variations on animals associated to gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, they all share similarities with humans. And so here we have zoomed in relationships between apes, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, and men. So most of these connections were done using um, essentially comparisons of functional, um, functional parts of chimps and gorillas and mans and noticing similarities between their bone structure and their skeletons. And of course, there are other ways of trying to classify organisms. Um, so this is a slide which I borrowed from another biology class where they consider the fact that chimps and gorillas were probably closer than they were to humans. So that means that they together formed a line which then bifurcated and humans separated off even earlier. This was somehow reassuring because we wanted to feel like we were further away from chimps and gorillas um, than chimps and gorillas are away from each other. Um, and various reasons for looking at this are there are types or shared traits um, between these, all of these, these two uh, taxa. Knuckle walking, then enamel, bipedalism, um, and this corresponds to features which humans have. However, part of the problem was we, we didn't really know um, how to actually prove whether or not uh, some common species that connects chimps and gorillas first split off from humans, or maybe it was the other way around. And this is when a, a new way of classifying um, and performing taxonomy called cladistics um, emerged. Um, and in my mind, we normally think of cladistics as associated to certain molecular techniques. Um, Part of this was pioneered by a scientist at Berkeley who died in 2012 by the name of Vincent Serge. Um, I was lucky enough to see Vincent Serge speak a few times when, when I was young. 
Either way, Vincent Serich and his PhD advisor, Alan Wilson, used a method known as molecular clocking to determine evolutionary relationships. The essential hypothesis here is that, you know, just as time marches on, you know, either via mutations that are caused by the sun or just, you know, mutations that occur in the replication that goes into forming of embryos and eggs and sperm, uh, that those happen at roughly a constant rate. And so that means that, you know, if you have two organisms which separated and then they each accrued um, mutations at roughly the same rate, you could do some estimations to see actually how far along were they before they separated, just knowing that the rate of mutation is roughly constant. And what was really amazing is that instead of using fossils, they were just able to use DNA sequencing, um, or at least sequencing associated to very particular um, genes or other uh, proteins called albumin. And from this, they were able to determine that actually humans and chimps um, stayed along together longer than gorillas and the human chimp you know, progenitor. And that in fact, the separation happened only four to six million years ago. Um, previous estimates before the work of Sarich and others had pegged the separation between humans and chimps um, closer to 10 to 30 million years ago. Again, we wanted to feel somehow superior to um, our primate cousins. Um, and then surprisingly, gorillas were thought to actually have separated off another two million years before that separation between humans and chimps. But the picture I want you to have in mind is the following. So by essentially looking at these sequences of A, G, T, Cs, and Gs, um, you could then produce a diagram called a dendrogram, which shows this hierarchy or tree of life uh, computed completely using these distances between strings of DNA. Um, we're going to get into how dendrograms are derived um, using various clustering techniques um, later in our course. But for now, I just want you to sort of take as a matter of, or suspend disbelief for a second, and think that it's reasonable that if I can compare sequences of DNA using some notion of distance, maybe not the Hamming distance, that we can then cluster, and what's more is determine within clusters how those clusters themselves merge together. There are lots of visual examples for how this works, but this is a more abstract one. Essentially, the work of Sarich and others were able to produce this diagram, which showed that indeed humans and chimps are very close genetically, and that in fact they're closer than, say, even um, chimps and gorillas. All right, so all of this was a long winded introduction and motivation for considering a more flexible distance something that's more flexible than the Hamming distance. Because we already saw that the Hamming distance essentially assumes that we have strings of the same length. And of course, there might be ways in which you could hack that to make it work, um, but we'll get to that in class. So let's consider the three operations that DNA mutation exhibit, at least these three. So one is substitution. So this is the same thing that we use in the Hamming distance. So for example, I can substitute maps and turn it into mops by substituting A with O. So that just takes one substitution, one character in the string. Alternatively, I can now consider matching strings of varying distance. For example, I can go from loud to aloud by inserting an A at the front of loud. And then finally, I can also go from a string of larger characters to a string of smaller characters, like spam to spa by just deleting the M at the end. So let's focus on those three operations, substitution, insertion, and deletion. And now let's consider the example which I put off um, from Hamming distances. So if you remember, these strings differ in every character but in this fourth position where E is a common character. So it's five letters, differs in every other character, so that means the Hamming distance is four. And indeed, we run our code, it agrees with that calculation. But now let's consider um, 
when we can use more operations, such as insertions, deletions, and substitutions. So if I take alien, one thing I could do is insert an S at the beginning of alien to obtain salient. That already looks pretty close to sales. Um, and that would have only been realized if I inserted that extra character. Now, with salient, I can imagine I delete the I. And sorry, there's an unnecessary S here. To obtain salient. So here I've gone from salient to salient. And now, just by substituting an N for an S, I can now go from salient to sales. And so I've now traced a path in string space from alien to sales. And I was able to do this using only three operations, single insert, single deletion, and a single substitution. So that means that the edit distance, which combines these three operations, um, is three. So I, again, I should give a caveat. So the distance on strings that uses these three types of mutations is actually called the Levenstein distance, um, named after a Russian mathematician um, from the mid 20th century. It is actually one of several types of edit distances. Um, we've already included the Hamming distance, but if you think back to those different mutations that occur in cancer, one of them was a transposition. And so you might think of that as another operation. Um, and the idea being that that only counts as one move rather than say, you know, two substitutions. Um, Anyways, for whatever reason, when I have operated as a researcher, I've noticed that people generally refer to, and our book CS for All refers to, the Levenstein distance as the edit distance. Now, I encourage you to try to read up and learn more about this at your leisure. And in fact, if you look around, you'll find all sorts of nice resources, things that connect to this to neuro-linguistic uh, natural language processing, sorry, wrong in LP, uh, which connects to natural language processing. Um, and here's one way of defining the minimum edit distance or minimum Levenstein distance between uh, two strings, A and B, length M and N. So imagine we define lev AB. So A and B are my strings to be the edit distance between the first I characters of string A and the first J characters of string B. Uh, you might think how you would express that using Python. So now, if I think about how this formula is defined, um, and we'll ex exam examine this in a little bit more, but if we just reference, say, this article, you'll see that Levenstein distance uh, between A and B evaluated at index I and index J. So that means I'm looking at the first I characters of A, first J characters of B. Well, first of all, if either of those entries, I or J, is equal to zero, then I'm just going to accept the fact that the only way I can go from that string to the other one is by inserting all of those missing characters, which means the opposite of the one that's zero. So meaning if min IJ is equal to zero, then you use the whole length of the other string. And then additionally, if you're not in this base case, um, you're going to have these various operations. Um, so, so this one here, this bottom line, corresponds to the substitution, um, at least at that ith and jth index, um, assuming that they're not equal. You'll add one. Um, if they are equal, then you can just look at the Levenstein distance of the first i and j, or the i minus 1 through j minus 1. So this somehow sort of operates from the end of the string rather than going from the other way. So this last case actually corresponds to substitution. Um, it recognizes whether or not there needs to be a flip at the end, um, flip from the character in A to the character at B at that in those indices, and then recursively calls this Levenstein function um, on the remaining part of the string, which in this case is the first i minus 1 and the first j minus 1. These other uh, distances are slightly different. So you can imagine I delete from my back end of B, and that's going to cause me to compare then the remaining of B, the first J minus 1, with all of the first I characters of A. Uh, 
And again, that sort of deletion I have to recognize by a penalty of one. And then you could do a similar thing here. Um, you could imagine, in this case, um, inserting, but we're going to see how that works via code. All right, so whenever you see a diagram like that, and you see a function that calls itself, even if it's just using mathematics and not necessarily in Python, you know that recursion is actually involved. So first thing you want to always do in recursion is think about the base case. So if I have that line max ij, if min ij is equal to zero, what's that essentially saying is that if I want to know the edit distance between two strings, and one of those strings is empty, then the distance is the length of the other string. And here's a succinct way of saying that. Look at both your strings. You ask, are either of those equal to zero? And in the case that one of them is, you're going to return the length of the other one, i.e. max of the length of these two. Because again, we're assuming that the length of the other string is, is it greater than or equal to zero. So that's the first step. We're going to build up our edit distance function using this analysis. The second step is to ask, what's another easy consequence? So instead of the way the Levenstein um, distance was defined in the previous uh, two slides, I'm going to imagine I'm marching from left to right. And so if the first two characters in my strings agree, then I'm just going to assume I don't need to do anything there. And I'm going to compute the edit distance on the remaining portions of the string. But here's my second iteration of this edit distance function, edit distance two. And you can see here, this is where I have my recursive call, which I know is going to end because I have this base case. Finally, I want to consider a strategy akin to what I did with the case of the subset sum problem, which, if you remember, takes in a capacity and then takes in a list of numbers and then asks for what subset or asks for a subset from that list that when I add all those numbers together, it gets as close to the capacity as possible without going over it. The complexity of this problem was 2 to the n. And we use the strategy of either using an entry as we scan from left to right or to losing it. So forgetting it and then trying to see if we do better by deferring to later items in the list. So we're going to be in the same situation here with the edit distance, um, except we have three different strategies. One where we're always going to substitute. And this is one where you can imagine it's sort of a modification of the Hamming distance. So what happens if S and T don't have the same starting character? And we can use a substitution in the very first entrance to make one character equal to the other. And then I recurse. I call the edit distance on the remaining of the string, where I've shifted over by one and looked at the remaining of the string um, to both S and T. Alternatively, you could try deleting the first string and then hoping that Maybe that's going to get you closer to sort of aligning these sequences. Um, in that case, you would think of, say, deleting the first entry in my first string and then recursing using the edit distance on the rest of the first string, uh, but still all of the second string, t. Alternatively, you could think of our insertion strategy, which is says, suppose I have two strings, s and t, and I'm trying to get from s to t. But I also know that the first two don't entries don't agree. So I could take whatever character sits in the first position on my second string and put that at the front of my first string. And I'm going to count that as an insertion and add a penalty of one. And now I'm going to consider the edit distance between uh, the original string. So that's why I haven't actually added one, because I've actually not had to record this operation. But now I'm trying to match with the remaining of the string the second string. Again, I've already assumed I've essentially forced to make these the first entries of these two strings match via an insertion. Um, and so now I'm asking about, well, how does the rest of the second string compare? Alternatively, you could think of this as deleting the first character of the second string um, and just hoping for better. All right, putting this all together, we now have our edit distance function. Um, and when I call it on my strings, for alien and sales, I get exactly the answer. I was able to compute the inspection. 
But of course, now I can use really complicated longer strings, and this will hopefully uh, do it automatically and algorithmically without me needing to stare too hard at it. I encourage you to take this code and go ahead and run it through Python Tutor to see what values are returned um, and at what steps. All right, that's all for today. I will leave you with three reflection questions to think about. So first question is, is the edit distance function symmetric in its arguments? So that means if I were to take edit distance of st, is that the same thing as edit distance between ts? Maybe just to make this more kosher, is this true? So what happens if I reverse these strings? Um, try to inspect the code and see if you think this is actually the case. Another question is, are, are these functions always non-negative? That should be an easy one. Third question, which is always the hardest whenever we think about a question like this, is does this satisfy the triangle any longer? Which means if I have, if I want to know the edit distance between string one and string two, and then string two and string three, that per, the sum of those two provides an upper bound for the string, the edit distance between S1 and S3. All right, we'll discuss this more in class. Well, and I look forward to seeing you all there.